Hello! In this video, I take you along my journey of creating a detailed model of this Zoom H4n Pro audio recorder. I will show you some time-lapse recordings and put a bunch of hopefully useful tips in here as well. I hope you like it and if you do, please hit the like button, share this video with other Blender heads and subscribe. Thanks! Modeling, materials and rendering is all done in Blender. For creating the labels and bump maps, I used Photoshop. And in case you were wondering, no, sadly I'm not sponsored by Zoom. Let's start at the beginning. A couple of months ago, Gleb Alexandrov and AD Burroughs came out with their hard surface modeling course and I think I must have been one of the first to buy it and watch all 13 hours of video within two days. In that course, they create a robot and use sub-D modeling as well as Boolean operators. Of course, I wanted to create something right away, but I really didn't want to make a robot for two reasons. First, you can basically make up whatever dimensions and proportions you like. I wanted to create something real, if that makes any sense. Second, the course was not about materials and they didn't really get into that, but materials are somewhat important to me. I want to make things look as real as possible or shall I say as close to the real thing as possible. A few days later I bought a Zoom audio recorder because I started making videos for YouTube and wanted to get better audio. Thanks to all the subscribers for the great and positive feedback by the way. As soon as I unboxed my shiny new toy I knew that this is a great challenge for me to recreate in Blender. So in the last few weeks I kept working on this and according to my screen recordings I spent about 30 hours in total. I realized once again how bad I am at modeling. So many of those hours were just trial and error, but that's okay. Before I started in Blender, I took some reference images with my camera from front, back, left, right, bottom and top. Then I straightened them all out, resized and aligned them in Photoshop and brought them into Blender as image empties. I decided to bottle everything to scale, so after I had that set up, I started boxing out the main shape of the casing. It took me a few failed attempts to get something usable, but I just kept trying. Here are some basic things you need to know before you get started. You can create an edge between two vertices by hitting F. And you can create a face between three or more vertices by also hitting F. When you have this kind of situation and you mark just two vertices, you can keep hitting F to create new edges and faces along the path. When you have this kind of situation and you want to create a new edge between those vertices, you probably don't want to use F because that creates an edge but leaves the big face as it is. Here you most likely want to hit the J key instead, which not only creates the edge but also splits the face into two new faces. If you have a mesh with faces on it, you can use K to cut in some new edges and vertices. With this knife tool, you also get very useful snapping to verts and edges. And you can also cut through multiple faces and edges, which creates all the necessary vertices and automatically splits the edges and faces. An easy way to expand onto existing geometry is to use E to extrude, which works on single vertices, on edges and entire faces. Similar to extruding is insetting, which is this sort of action, creating new vertices and edges but keeping them on the same plane. You can bevel an edge with Ctrl B, then move the mouse to set the distance and scroll the mouse wheel to set the number of cuts. And of course you have to move things with G and rotate things with R and move vertices along an edge by double tapping G. Don't forget that there are some powerful tools for advanced operations in the select and mesh menus. And Blender always shows handy infos and possible operations in the header. Back to the model. The inside of the casing will never be visible so I really didn't care too much about the topology there. But since we will be using boolean modifiers it is extremely important to have an airtight mesh. What does that mean exactly? In the real world even the thinnest material has some thickness to it. In 3D we mostly model the surface only, but that would actually be infinitely thin and not real. In order to get a 3D model that can exist in the real world, in CG that's called a manifold mesh, you need to give it volume and model all of the outside surfaces. So you need to close up the surface and you can't have any interior faces. 
It's also good to not have any loose geometry and make sure that the normals point in the correct direction. Usually you want all normals pointing outwards. Check out the Select Non-Manifold tool, which can help you find problems. For my audio recorder casing, and in fact all other parts here as well, that means creating some sort of inside geometry to make it into a real airtight 3D object. When I model something, I pretty much look at the rendered view right from the beginning to get a true impression of what I'm doing. This also means that I need to get into material setups and lighting right away. Plenty of area lights with different square and rectangular shapes all around the model ensure that I can look at it from all possible angles and get nice highlights and shadows to see all the fine details and bump maps. Once you have a decent mesh, you can use the boolean modifier to cut things into it, all in a non-destructive way, which I really like. You can even add a whole bunch of boolean modifiers on the same object and it works just fine. The boolean operations do mess up the geometry a lot though, especially when you want smooth shading. So here is what I have learned to get almost perfect looking results. You pretty much always want auto smooth on and also adjust the angle of the auto smooth to make the surface look good. The order of the modifiers is absolutely crucial. First you subsurf the mesh, then you cut away with boolean modifiers and lastly you add a tiny bevel. This bevel at the end is super important and without it the boolean cuts can really look like crap. And even its settings like segments, profile and angle can be important. So do play with these in combination with the auto smooth angle. Check out the bool tool add-on that comes with Blender since it might help you speed up the process of creating boolean modifiers. And also good to know, if your object has smooth shading and you cut into it with an object that has flat shading, the newly created faces will inherit that flat shading. Enable smooth shading on your boolean operand object to get a smooth surface. For the four little screws in the front and also two in the back, I used the bolt factory add-on that comes with Blender and cut off the thread part that's not visible anyway. When using the mirror modifier, a UV map will only be that half of the model. But you don't have to apply the mirror, you can simply enable texture flipping and use the offset to move textures to the correct location. The tripod mount in the back is another bolt from the bolt factory where I just left the threads and cut away everything else and then fitted it into the casing. For bump maps I always fill the background with 50% grey and then make the details that are supposed to stick out lighter and things that go inwards darker. And don't forget to add a little bit of blur to the image before using it as a bump map. That's to avoid infinitely sharp edges that cannot exist in real life. I recreated the LCD display pixel by pixel in Photoshop instead of using a photo. This way it is perfectly sharp, but only when you set the interpolation type to closest on the image node.
The new bevel node is really awesome for hard surface models like this one. Of course you model the surface with real bevels, but with a tiny little bit of the bevel node effect on the material. All the hard cuts from the boolean operation suddenly catch the light and make the whole thing look that much more realistic. Because remember, there simply are no infinitely sharp edges in real life. It's really awesome and can be slapped onto any material, even daisy chained with bump maps. Here I am redoing the entire microphone base and mics at the top of the recorder because I was not happy with what I had. I want to mention though that in general I do not obsess over perfect quad based topology. As long as it looks right and works I'm happy and if I need to I can still go in and fix things. Also again I am sadly really not very good at modeling. After I was happy with the model, I spent several hours fixing some minor issues I found after doing many test renders, from all angles. Perfecting materials and adding imperfections like fingerprint smudges for photorealism and other random variations. Figuring out decent render settings, adjusting the lighting, creating the animation path and camera settings, and so on and so forth. And this is the result. The next step is to take all of this into 2.8 Eevee, but that's another video. Subscribe to see that when it's done. If you like this video, please comment, subscribe and share and check out the other videos on my channel. I put some links in the description. Have a great day. See you next time.